Donald Wright is a uh, writer of fiction and nonfiction. He's a novelist, and uh, the part that really appeals to me, he's an adventurer. He's preoccupied with themes that have to do with time. And if I can call him up on stage now, perhaps he'll tell us more. Well, those martinis look awfully good. It's, uh, it's cocktail hour. In fact, they looked a lot better than your feet, Moses. <laughs> but uh, I do have to start on a, on a rather sad note, though, because um, as many of you probably know, uh, today um, or last night in Paris, uh, Timothy Findlay died. Uh, one of our great novelists, and for me, um, I associate him very much with coming to Canada. Although my father was from British Columbia, I grew up in England, uh, came here to go to grad school. And one of the first, my first encounters with a Canadian novel and novelist was listening to Timothy Finley beautifully read from The Wars on CBC Radio. And it was a wonderful introduction to Canadian writing and to Canadian broadcasting. Um, anyway, it's, it's, it's a sad time, but I don't think Timothy Finley would be the guy to want us to be too somber. Uh, also, an event like this would hold no terrors for a guy like Tiff because he was uh, an accomplished actor and uh, great personality in the theater. So, but I, let me tell you, an event like this for a lot of writers, and that includes me, is deeply terrifying because we don't usually let our first thoughts go out. <laughs> we do a lot of drafts. Uh, we, we put stuff away in a drawer for months and bring it out and look at it again and, and uh, try and get it right and avoid the worst mistakes. So getting up here and speaking uh, without something that's been written over a few times is, is quite intimidating. So I have got a crib sheet in my pocket, which I will probably refer to. Um, I expect a lot of you know, <laughs> yeah, memory kicked in just in time. Um, I expect a lot of you know that famous Gauguin painting, um, one of his very large Tahitian canvases. Um, and it is in, it's a, sort of, it's a very surreal painting showing ancient gods and mysterious scenes. Um, it's not clear what the painting means, although it is, it is full of symbols of, that explore, I think, the human experience in a very otherworldly place from what he was used to. After all, he was a stockbroker who gave it all up at 40 and went to Tahiti. But, um, and the painting is captioned simply, who are we, where do we come from, and where are we going? Uh, and I, I saw that picture as a child, and, and it led me to an interest in the human past uh, history, but also a much deeper kind of, of history, which uh, is archaeology. Uh, I never became an archaeologist, but I studied it at Cambridge and then at Calgary here in Canada. And in fact, I dropped out of grad school. But the, the interest and the deep perspective on time was very valuable to me in understanding what I am. Um, and very valuable in, as a, a training for a writer. I think all writers write about the human experience. Some focus in very, very fine detail on, on something that is very much of the here and now. Um, what's always been interesting to me is are the deep patterns in the past and how we need to know these patterns in order to understand what we are and where we might be going. And I think many of the speakers who've um, spoken here over the last three days have tackled those themes. After all, who are we? Where do we come from? Where are we going? That says a lot. It covers a lot. It doesn't answer a lot. Um, I've, I've, sort of, I've tried to do these things in several books, some nonfiction and more recently in two novels. But getting back to archaeology for a minute, most people, when they go to an ancient ruin, say, an ancient site where you come into contact with something left from the distant past, the first question that pops up is, what happened here? Uh, what was it like when people lived here? But the thing that, I, that comes to, came to me anyway when I became interested in archaeology was 
when I'm walking through a modern city, I'm walking through Manhattan or London or uh, some other place that we think of as, as fairly intensely modern, is what will this pl place be like when it's a ruin? <laughs> and to sort of put yourselves into that deep time frame of mind, we'll just ask you to think about what Toronto will be like when it's a ruin. Uh, what will people think who come here? I mean, it will be a ruin one day. Uh, that cannot be avoided. Um, what will people who come here and look at it and wonder about it uh, think about it? And what will what we're doing here and now? What message will that send to them? Uh, so this is the long view, an attempt to break up what I call the parochialism of the present. I, the present is pressing in on us so insistently, more insistently than ever before, with the many, many kinds of media that we're exposed to. Um, and, and also the very fast pace that culture moves, so we constantly have to keep up to date, that we're, we're losing touch with the past. We're, we're sort of like somebody who is on a page of a very long book, and the page may be rather near the end, but we haven't got time to read all the stuff that came before. And so we don't really know uh, how the story has gone and where it might lead. The past is, especially in North America, and, and as somebody who came here in his 20s, um, I came to a place from a country, England very much focuses on its past. I mean, Winston Churchill's already been quoted here today. I mean, he was always fond of saying that the key to our future is in our past. Um, but when you come to North America, it's all about the future. I think it's partly because the early immigrants came here to, to leave things behind that they didn't like about the old world. They also never really felt they belonged here because they knew that there were people here before who they were displacing. Uh, and so it became very much a place where you sort of clean the slate, start again, and go for it. And, and there's much to be said for that, but there are also enormous risks in that. Um, you know, and I think the past in North America is very often sort of confined to a theme park, it becomes something like Niagara on the Lake or uh, a convenient source of restaurant decor. If you, I think we need to think of the human career as an experiment. And um, this is an experiment started by nature. All species are experiments that nature's carrying out. Uh, they're, all species are works in progress. Uh, you know, there are a few classic designs, uh, such as the crocodile has been around for 200 million years, pretty much the same. Uh, it's older than the dinosaurs. But we're very much the other kind. We've been around a very short time. Uh, we may think it's a long time, but it's a very short time ago that, that nature sort of started thinking, what happens if we increase the intelligence of apes? Um, and then after, and that started uh, Lionel Tiger mentioned two million years, you start getting the first tools and so on, but even if we call it just one million years, when creatures very similar to ourselves were walking about, and we're certainly not apes anymore at that point. Um, there have been stages when we've suddenly ratched up, we've begun to take over the experiment from nature and run it ourselves without being aware that we were doing so. Perhaps the first big increase in our power to, uh, over our own future um, was when we discovered fire. Uh, and not just because we could keep warm in cold climates, but we could, and we could cook our food, which probably uh, saved us a lot of uh, trouble with parasites and whatnot. But it also was a way, we set fire to whole landscapes. We changed entire landscapes with fire. We, we, we would replace savanna uh, bushes and forests and turn it into grass uh, so that the, the new shoots would come up in the spring and the, and the deer would come or the other animals. Um, some people say that Australia, where humans have lived very close to nature is still a landscape totally transformed by fire of artificial origin. Uh, then about 10,000 years ago, we, en we invented farming. We, deci we discovered that uh, if you settle down, instead of going around looking for lots of plants in the wild and trying to kill things in the wild, you, you capture your animals, you breed them, you pick a few plants, you put them in the ground, it's a lot easier. And that was when things really started to change. Suddenly we became settled. Um, we began to need things like irrigation, somebody to organize the irrigation. And civil, uh, farming very quickly led to civilization. Now I'm talking here 
about civilization very much in the, in the anthropological sense. And um, my first novel is two books back, A Scientific Romance, is, is a book very much a, a, a meditation on civilization, what it's done, where it might go. Um, and I'm just going to read you a few quotes in it. They're not from me. They're from things that other people have said about civilization, some of them perhaps uh, tongue in cheek, but all of them I think worth hearing. Civilization is plumbing. Now somebody said that less elegantly as, you know, civilization is the distance you put between yourself and your shit. <laughs> civilization requires slaves. Civilization is when a few people begin telling a lot of people what to do. Civilization is arranging the world so you don't need to experience it. We've got air conditioning on now. Civilization is the gradual replacement of men by things, or people by things. Civilization is living beyond your means. And then I have one of my characters take off from that and say that civilization is a pyramid scheme. And we're all familiar that civilization, early civilizations tended to build pyramids. If you want to build a big, impressive, tall building and you haven't got reinforced concrete, uh, you start big at the bottom and you go small towards the top. And you might use it as a temple platform or a tomb, but you've got a pyramid. Uh, you also need an awful lot of people uh, to build it without question and have to believe that it's a worthwhile activity. Uh, so 10,000 years ago, Seems like a long time, we started civilization. But if we call ourselves a million years old, uh, that's only 1% of our time on Earth. And if we just confine that sort of math to, to our own subspecies, Homo sapiens, been around about 100,000 years, people exactly like us have been around 10 times longer than, than anybody lived in, in a civilization. So we're not really evolved for this kind of life, uh, and we're still, we're still doing things that we don't understand. In fact, we're ratcheting up really quickly. There's, there's been a tremendous acceleration. I mean, watching the baby fly out of the womb and land in the tomb, that's how fast we're moving. You've got a million years, 10,000 years ago, farming and civilization, and then a couple of hundred years ago, industry. Suddenly, the population mushrooms. Uh, now, if you look at the civilizations of the past, what you find out is that they are very often, the common pattern that occurs is that they are the victims of their own success. And if you go to the Near East, you go to some of those wonderful mud brick ruins of cities like Babylon or Ur of the Chaldees, and what you see there is a desert, very often a salty desert, with these mud brick buildings dotted above. The desert is a desert of that city's making. Irrigation, wonderful idea when you start it. You, you run the water in, you don't have to wait for the rain. You keep on doing it too long, the soil gets salty, you can't grow anything. There's a misuse, a civilizations up the ante, they screw more out of nature, and so there's a misuse of natural capital. They actually drain down the natural diversity uh, in order to uh, finance themselves in the broad sense. And when they get into trouble and how they get into trouble is very much a matter of scale and of, of timing. I mean, you think of some people who move down into a valley and they clear the bush and you've got this lovely fertile land and it's right next to a river and you've got water and you've got land and it's just ideal and you settle there and you have a village. But because it's ideal, the population increases and the village gets bigger. And sooner or later, you've paved the valley for living space and all your waste has gone into the water and it's turned from being a paradise into a kind of hell. And that has happened many times. Just to take, the, you know, there are many exceptions to this, of course, um, but just to take two little cases that are easy to, to, to talk about in a, in a very short time. And one of them is Easter Island. And you get the Polynesians sailing out there, discovering that island not all that long ago, a time counted in centuries rather than, than millennia and finding a heavily treed little island in the southern part of Polynesia, and settling it, and starting to cut down the trees and plant their crops, and everything goes fine for a long time. But 
of course, the population increases and the same pattern repeats itself. Eventually, they cut down all the trees. Um, the soil starts to wash away into the sea. And uh, they've been using a lot of those trees to put up those big statues, the ancestor cult, which is their local equivalent of a pyramid. So you've got an awful lot of work going into building these, quotes, pyramids. Uh, a, an enormous cost to nature to do it. Uh, and then it all ends in wars between chiefdoms, starvation leading to cannibalism, and they couldn't even leave the island because they didn't have enough wood left to build a canoe. Uh, if you look at a more complex civilization, take the, the, the classic Maya, and I'm not talking about the, um, the collapse of the Maya due to the arrival of Europeans, which is another story. But they went through an earlier collapse of their own making. Uh, it took a long time. They're one of only two civilizations to thrive in a jungle. And they did very well for hundreds of years. But eventually, the population got too big. They cut down too much of the jungle. They disrupted natural rainfall patterns. They were hit by a series of droughts. Uh, they also, the social structure became top heavy. You've got the skeletons of the, as Kathy Reichs was talking about what you can learn from skeletons, you've got the skeletons of the ruling class, tall people, obviously fat, many of them. Uh, the peasants getting smaller and smaller through time. A recipe for disaster. And that's what happened. Um, the time, I'm going to have to move along a bit here, but um, in, that, in the case of the Maya, literal pyramids, the city of Tikal has five enormous pyramids. They're, they're almost like skyscrapers, 250 feet high rising out of the jungle. And if you walk around there, you feel like you're in a kind of early Manhattan. All those, and the city was about 2,000 years old. All of those five pyramids were built in the last 100 years. What we have now, and you know, in this human experiment with civilization, we've got different ones popping up in different parts of the world. And one goes down, another learns from it, or maybe just arises independently in another place, and the experiment keeps going. But what we face now is we really have, in effect, one big civilization that is able to, re to feed on resources anywhere in the world and does so. Uh, and we're really, we've got all, everything is, all the bets are on this one throw. Uh, since 1900, the world population has increased by four times. The consumption of resources has increased by 40 times. The population of people, the number of people in abject poverty now is greater than the, entire, the entirety of humankind in 1900. So I think we need to look at that and say, is that progress? A lot of us are living very well there have been enormous benefits produced by civilization, people, medical benefits, for example, many scientific breakthroughs. But two out of three people on Earth have never made a telephone call. We're in a situation which is comparable almost to that of pre-revolutionary France uh, in terms of the disparity between rich and poor. The three richest individuals, all of whom are Americans, have a greater net worth than the poorest 48 countries. The idea that everybody can, will, can attain the kind of prosperity that even our middle class or even our, our um, poorest income levels in Canada enjoy is, I think, the big, li the big lie of our time because there's just no way that the natural capital of this planet can support consumption on that level. Now, I may begin to sound like a raving lefty here, but I don't think it's really helpful to think about this as a left-right split at all. What we need to think about is what is adaptive? What is the right thing to do now? And the, the place to start is to say there isn't any room left for mistakes. Now, I'm running out of time quite soon. Um, we're in a situation where the most, we have a, a, a new kind of global empire forming, the most powerful country. But that polity is pretty much being run by the stock market. So we have the driving policy in the world today is that of a casino. And it happens to be a casino that has a big military machine that it owns and operates. I don't know what the answer is. I don't know how we plan or who does the planning and how we know whether the planners are right. But all I do know is that when you're, you're very close to hitting the wall, um, first of all, you've got to realize that. And secondly, 
you have to follow the precautionary principle. You say, it might not be wise to build bigger and bigger SUVs and use up all the gasoline and pollute the atmosphere. Better not to do that. And you know, we could, we could have pretty nice cars if we drove European vehicles instead of that iron that comes out of Detroit. Uh, and the other thing I think is that I might be sounding like a raving greedy, but I'm not. I agree with what Spider Robinson said. You, we can't go back, not without a massive collapse in our population, which would be horrendous. And that is what we have to avoid. Uh, we have to take the good things we have, uh, the things that, that will work and that can save us, and we have to be careful, and we have to deal with the problems. And if we had used the kind of resources that we put into the Cold War, the arms race, and the United States is about to put 100 billion into this Star Wars uh, so-called missile shield. If we put those kinds of resources into figuring out how we make room for everybody, how we make room for the other creatures on the planet so that we don't live in a diminished world, so that our children and grandchildren don't inherit a world where it's only people and a few things like cats and rats, uh, you know, that's where we have to put the resources. And letting that be driven by one year, two year, three year, or five year bottom lines is not the answer. Civilization has given us all the benefits we have, all the things we enjoy, art, architecture, music, all these wonderful things. We mustn't lose it, but we're gonna to have to work very hard and very wisely to keep it. In this book, A Scientific Romance, I showed a future world where it's all gone horribly wrong and somebody wanders around our ruins as we wander around the ruins of a Maya city. That's the answer we don't want. And I'm going to finish now, and I'll leave you just with one line from the historian Eric Hobsbawm at the very end of his wonderful history of the 20th century called Age of Extremes. He says, the alternative to a changed society is darkness. So on that very optimistic note, thank you very much. <laughs>